Way to salvation is difficult. Reading from Matthew chapter 22, verses 17 to 21. Tell us therefore what thinkest thou. Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar? Not. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt you me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. Not a penny as we think of one. This was a coin worth, worth significantly more. And he, said, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Man was made by God in his image for God's service and God's purposes. When this is carefully considered and comprehended, even a tiny bit in line with a biblical understanding of the extent of man's obligations towards his creator, this is one of the most awesome and terrifying statements ever uttered. In Revelation 4, 10 and 11, we read, Revelation 4, 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And then Acts 17, 24 to 28 says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitations, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said he was speaking to the Athenians, for we are also his offspring. Along these lines God thus warned a man in the Bible through his servant Daniel, of his imminent judgment for worshipping idols compatible with the pursuit of his own pleasure and his own glory. In Daniel 5.23, B. Um, Daniel told the wicked king of Babylon, and the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified him? Hast thou, hast thou not glorified? And Daniel would go on to tell him later in the chapter in verse 27, Thou art weighed in the balances and, and art found wanting. Not even the understanding of what it properly means to worship and glorify the true God is enough until proper understanding is truly submitted to. Mark chapter 12 verses 28 to 34 a. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is, and the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Master, well, Master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself, is more than all whole burnt, is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And by the way, this is why it is our duty it is our duty to protect unborn babies from their potentially murderous mothers and those who would aid them in their murder. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Modifications of God's worship do not cut it. Conflict to, conflict of interest must be decided in favor of the truth of the God of the Bible, so that the interests which create the conflict are crucified and put down, as much as they oppose the truth of God. Neither will man's innovation substitute for this um, true sum neither will man's innovation substitute um, for true submission to the God of the Bible, to worship him in spirit and truth according to his own terms. Cain learned this lesson in a hard way early on in Scripture, and God's rebuke to him to drive this lesson home was the instance where man's is the instance where man's anger is first recorded in the Bible. Man's own ideas to get around submission to God, and man's offering of the left and man's attempt to offer the leftovers of his life to God, thinking God will be pleased with such, provoke him to anger. Malachi one eight. 
And if ye offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if ye offer the lame and sick, is it not evil? Consider the figurative application of this. Offer it now unto thy governor. Will he be pleased with thee? Or accept thy person, saith the Lord of hosts. Proverbs 15, 8 to 11. The, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? First, First Samuel 15, 22b to 23a. Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is, is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry, or lawlessness and idolatry. The way of the world is to take care of yourself first, to put first the things you need, or the things you think you need, and the things you highly value. And then, and then maybe offer to God something from there, if you acknowledge him at all. Or maybe even more convenient, just sculpt your understanding of God so that pursuing him and pursuing your own interests are pretty much compatible already. Yet Jesus said that to serve God acceptably, you must worship and serve him according to how he has revealed himself, according to his terms, with one's whole heart, soul, strength, and mind, with one's natural interests, not taking precedence, not taking precedence, over submitting to God and doing what is righteous before him. Jesus' use of hyperbole to express this only drives the point home deeper, um, that you can't cut corners in this, nor allow it to take a back seat. Matthew 6, um, verses 24 to 34. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and man, money, material possessions. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment or clothing? Um, behold the fowls of the year, for they, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal, wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. In the context, all these things do the heathen idolaters seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. The heathen idolaters seek these things preeminently. But Jesus says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek that preeminently and his righteousness. And all these things, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the moral. For the moral shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. It's obvious that multitudes will go to hell for not abandoning that which is obviously wicked and immoral in God's sight. And professing Christianity has has been corrupted so much that even that statement is controversial and many do not agree to that. But I could quote dozens of Bible verses about how fornicators, all who are sexually immoral in any way according to God's definition in the Bible all liars, idolaters, murderers, thieves, those who hate, those who dishonor their parents, those who practice witchcraft and all sorcery in any form, will surely have their part in the eternal lake of fire. That is certainly true. Yet it still doesn't in itself it still does not in itself express the depth of submission to worship and serve the true God acceptably that must be in an, that must be in an individual's heart in order for them to inherit salvation. There must be an unwavering intent, an unwavering intent to truly love God and do what is pleasing in his sight. Only those who have this will inherit his kingdom. This must stem from a proper recognition of his authority, power, character, 
and his sovereign right to us. That recognition must be applied by a living faith that obeys Jesus Christ and holds on to him as if one's only hope is truly in being properly related to him. He is indeed the one and only Lord and Savior. Um, reading from Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14. The two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. And publicans were tax collectors employed by the Romans who had a reputation for greed and dishonesty. Um, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not so much as lift up his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. This man that exalted himself didn't break before God through a recognition of his deep obligation to him, and his deeply deserved condemnation for his own sins. He rested in the fact that he looked better than men who did not seem so moral outwardly, and who were not as religiously scrupulous as himself. Yet someone who glories like this inevitably comes short of worshiping God in spirit and in spirit and in truth. Um, like Christ rejecting Jews have always been, and like many professing Christians are too. Um, this man and those like him are no better off before God than the openly immoral. Um, and many and and Judaism, Christian and professing Christianity are so corrupt now that they could even be openly immoral themselves and still go in with this. And so when when a person, whether they had been openly immoral or not, whether they had been openly immoral or not, gets the message and repents of their treason, their treason towards the Lord, and every expression of that, so that they worship and glorify him from the heart, like the shallow religious man failed to do. And they follow through with that with works in keeping with repentance. There will be um they will find um forgiveness, justification, and life from God, since God is merciful and gracious in a way which the world in general does not esteem does not esteem, and the religious world especially does not embrace, but rather is offended by. No flesh will glory in God's presence. And those who retain their natural pride in any and all concepts and per persist in any and all actions also which oppose the true God and the Lordship of Christ will not be ready to stand before God. Continuing in Luke um, chapter 18 verses 15 to 27. And they brought unto him also infants, very little children, that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily or truly I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is God. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal. Do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? They understood Jesus was speaking figuratively about a camel going through the, the eye of a needle, but they still understood the point. Being saved is very difficult, especially for a rich man. And he said the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Um, this rich young ruler, this, this man looked good. This man was indeed better than most. This man had a spiritual hunger and a strong intent on getting right with God. He had nothing openly immoral, nor obviously wrong about him to repent of. Yet he was not detached from every hindrance to walking before God in truth and righteousness. Um, to be a disciple of Christ who could indeed be taught in that, 
as children can be molded by instruction due to the qualities which they generally possess, was something that this ruler indeed lacked. In his case, Jesus knew that by selling everything he had, his false security and money, along with his good name and prestige in the eyes of society, would be dealt a death blow, which would free him to live to please God and be molded by truth. Otherwise, he would not be in such a position. Um, his pomp and natural pride had to be broken. These are things, um, pomp and natural pride are things which children generally don't really have. And they're things which the poorest of this world typically don't have as much of. And this has to do with why they have an advantage to laying hold of salvation in Christ compared to others. Yet man's flesh is so evil and deceitful that there can even be a pride in poverty which can that which even might keep a person from being a true disciple of Christ who is submitted to his word and an heir of God's kingdom. Um, building one's life on the solid rock of Jesus Christ's authority is a great work of the heart. No person can come can come to true faith in him apart from. Remember Jesus said in John chapter six that this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. Many come short of this because they don't thirst for righteousness and life from God. They also do not value being just in his sight like they ought to, in recognition of his eternal power and the inherently eternal consequences of our response to him in this life. Many do, however, come to a shallow faith in Christ which leaves them yet bound by sin and bound in the pursuit of righteousness. This will not, pre this will not profit a man on judgment day. Luke 6, um, 46 to 49. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me, and heareth my sayings, and doeth them. I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house, and dig deep, and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house, and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Luke thirteen twenty three to 24 Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. There is no such thing as a sinful saint, a half-hearted Christian who is on track to being saved, in, in, in their half-hearted state. And the lukewarm will get spewed out of Jesus' mouth, as he said in Revelation chapter 3. Um... There are many false teachers who promote many false Jesuses as well. Transgressors are getting worse. Seducers who have a form of godliness, a form of godliness or a form of Christianity, yet deny the power thereof, are getting worse and more subtle as well. James chapter one verses twelve to twenty seven we read, "Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord which the Lord hath promised to them that love him." Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not hear, my beloved brethren. Every good every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow turning. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of not ease. This is all filthiness and superfluity of not ease. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving their own selves. For if any man be a, a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, uh, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, 
to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. And then as the book of James continues, it speaks about a key aspect of being a doer of the word, and of visiting the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and keeping oneself unspotted from the world. And that is, um, and, and that is that he goes on to speak about not having the faith of Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect to persons, as you read in to James chapter 2 there. And that is truly one of the most difficult aspects of righteousness and where multitudes fail and, and live in sin. Even if there is much about Christianity otherwise, which they appreciate and might be willing to walk in, to not be tainted by people's relation to us and our moral judgments and our choices related to worship is easier said than done. To not be tainted by our race, our family, or some group we see as our own when evaluating. To not be tainted by the respect of our race, our family, or some group we see as our own when evaluating actions related to them is a hard thing. When Moses did the right thing to defend the Hebrews from the oppression of the Egyptians, um, he not only um, fell from the grace of the Egyptians, he had come to see himself as a part of, that he had become a part of. He, uh, he was also not appreciated by the Hebrews, and he got driven from them as well. The apostles of Christ were Jews who, like the one they served, were rejected by the Jews as a whole. Yet many early Christians fell away from Christ to get back into the good grace of the larger Jewish community. Righteousness demands that we be ready to face rejection from our own tribe, our own tribe, whether that is our immediate family, a larger natural affiliation, our ethnic group, or some other group which we um have come to align ourselves with, or, or see, or we have an image of ourselves of maybe even hoping to be aligned with or wishing we were. It often it often even involves leaving a church you were raised in, or maybe even harder, a church which you had joined thinking you were doing what was pleasing to God, but later upon receiving better instruction of God's will in the Bible and a better understanding of that group, you came to see that there was a conflict. The Bible says in Proverbs 17:15, he, he that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, even they both are abomination to the Lord. It was not to no purpose then that Jesus said, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 to 39, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. And then closely related to that in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 27, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto, Jer unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, and listen to the reason. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Obviously, following Jesus for anyone will mean a choice to value, to value the things of God over the things which are of men. There will surely be much conflict in this, and choosing right will result in rejection from men and loss in this world. And you can be sure that such rejection and loss in relationship, in relation, and you can be sure that such rejection and loss in relation to being faithful to the Lord will happen with relationships you greatly, you greatly value. And with things, including things like self-image and esteem from certain segments of society, it will it will involve choosing right for the Lord will involve the loss of such things which you greatly value. Suffering in life is inevitable, but suffering for the Lord's sake is not. The norm is to turn from the Lord and avoid the suffering for righteousness' sake, which comes with identifying with Him in His cross, and that suffering and enduring and embracing that uh, identifying with the Lord in, in that is the only way to salvation. Micah 6, 8 says, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. 
You also read in Amos 3.3 3, that can two walk together except they be agreed? That's a rhetorical question. Obviously, the answer is no. Um, you cannot be obedient to such, such exhortations and thus be in the grace of God if respect of persons controls you in any way. Consider the exhortation of Micah 6, 8 and Amos 3, 3, practically in your decisions. What adjustments might you have to make to really do this? Um, in, the, in, in being obedient to this exhortation, um, therein is the true grace of God, since heeding this exhortation in truth is exercising a living faith in Christ. And this is the only way to obtain righteousness in life through his atoning death and saving life. Someone who does this will be careful with their eyes on the internet and all other times. Careful to how they can use their money for the gospel and to care for the poor and needy. Careful that they don't defraud their neighbor. Careful to read the Bible daily to receive better understanding and, and instruction in God's will. Careful that they understand well so that they can in truth uphold righteousness and have no part in wickedness. Um, they will not be careful, though, to get fun and momentary gratification. They will be willing to let these go and only get them as they can have them in righteousness, as they wholeheartedly pursue righteousness before God. They will be ready and willing to suffer for truth. And you can be sure that everyone who doesn't obey um, this exhortation and, and all the righteous exhortations and scriptures um, which would include those who get deceived by false Jesuses, false gospels, and seducing spirits, which don't line up with God's revelation of himself in scripture, you can be sure that these did not value righteousness greatly, and they were indeed w unwilling to suffer for truth, at least in some shape or form. A lot of sermons end with soft music, altar calls, sinners' prayers, and other such things. Yet I want to warn you that you could respond to a thousand such things and never really turn to God in your heart, and never really settle the controversies there regarding his rightful reign and authority over you. Never really render unto God the things which be God's. You have to choose to embrace Jesus Christ so that he is preeminent in your heart, so that you are submitting, so that you are submitted to learning to observe all he has commanded. And so the truth of his word is what all your decisions are filtered through. Just because some are so wicked that they, fil that they filter the truth of his word out of all their decisions, we should not think that God would accept anything less from us than the opposite. The risen Jesus whom the Apostle John saw in the book of Revelation is the same Jesus that we will all stand before. Put that on your calendar. Besides the death which will lead to that, it is the only sure thing for us. All other plans should take a back seat to that and be scrapped if they need to be. In order to properly, in order to properly prepare for that, they are by no means they are by no they are by no means guaranteed to happen anyways. James chapter four verses thirteen to seventeen. Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him to sin. Revelation chapter 1 verses 10 to 18. I was, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, talking about the apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his ears were were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And we read later in the book of Revelation that 
Jesus will smite the nations with that two-edged sword that goes out of his mouth, as he in righteousness judges and maketh war with his enemies. And when I saw him, Revelation 1.17, John continues, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. John was a righteous man, remember. That's why he told him to fear not. Everybody else, everybody who is not righteous and unprepared to meet him should fear and settle their controversies with him now and take his side and stay on his side to the end because there is, um, because the terror of the day of judgment otherwise and, uh, um, and the terror of being un unprepared to stand before him will be worse than anything that any human being could ever imagine. So he says, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and is dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. He will prevail. He will prevail in us, whether he saves us or condemns us. Whether, um, and that will be based upon that will be based upon our siding with him. He is not a respecter of persons, and he will render unto every man according to his deeds, according to their response to his glorious gospel that we read in the book of Revelation 14. It's a call to fear God and give glory to him and worship him that created all things. Jesus is alive forevermore, and has the keys of hell and of death. He that has ears to hear, let him hear.